it's kind of like a fractal where where even when when certain doors are closed, you get into something, there's still so many possibilities within it. And I found that the only thing that you really shouldn't do, and this gets back to curiosity, if you want to, to have an interesting life and experiences and move forward, is that you can't stay in the same place. And, and you, you know, you can't just work it out in your head and just and make all those decisions in your mind and then go do it you you have to continue to move and and try things and explore and and so forth so. welcome to the spark of splendor podcast where we celebrate everything creative about you welcome julian so happy that you're here honestly i am as I was sharing just a minute ago, really my desire with this show and with this podcast is to have great conversations. I love talking to people. I love interviewing people. And you are a wonderful, very interesting, super awesome person. And we got to reconnect after all these years. Yeah. Um, and it was just so nice to hear you tell stories and to speak with you. So I was happy that I got to run into you and then here we are now. Yes. Yeah. Of splendor, celebrating the divine spark of splendor that is within us and within every living being. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me and and you know, giving me occasion to wear my my fanciest pants. <laughs> but unfortunately, it doesn't really translate so well on Zoom, but trust me, they're they're pretty fancy. Did so. you really wear fancy pants? You know, you'll never know. <laughs> Because I was going to wear a skirt and I was like, I think I'm just going to wear sweatpants. Right. <laughs> they're actually really nice sweatpants. So like, you know, I just they're, did. They're spark of splendor sweatpants. <laughs> we could, there you go. That's right. Let's do it. Let's do a shameless pl plug for like swag of spark right. of splendor. What do we start with? Sweatpants? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I think it's got to be like something with a star or radiance or light. I think, yeah, I mean, maybe it's like, or, or maybe it's just like a sleep mask where where it's like splendor, you know, sparkles on the inside. I don't know. Who knows? We'll, we'll figure it out. Maybe that's what that's what we'll work on. on this. I never story. had I never had this idea, but look where look where we're going already. Yeah, um, yeah who knows what will emerge. And that's right. the beauty here. And, you know, I was actually just listening to you speak. And I think I was actually there in person when you were talking about your Hyperloop project. Oh, and, yeah. And I, so I was just like, let me go and like see some of the old things. And it was so cool to see like, so you were trained as an anthropologist uh -huh. and now you're an educator and a strategist mm -hmm. and a design leader. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear um, just a little bit about like, where you started and yeah, how's it going? So like my educational background is in, uh, I have an undergraduate degree in anthropology, cultural and physical anthropology. And then um, let me see, after graduating from, from college and I have kind of a, uh, I had a, a concentration also in English literature, just to, to, as an aside, after that, I, uh, I ended up moving to Scotland where I managed a bar for a year or, or several bars out there and just had this big adventure. And then tr that's when I traveled to India and Nepal for three months and traveled around there. And during the, the next four summers or right, right after college, I went back to this camp that I used to work at uh, or that I used to go to as a kid, uh, which specializes in wilderness canoe tripping and so I worked there for for two months each summer and led these wilderness trips where they we go like 30 days at a time into northern Quebec have resupply drop by air airdrop uh and it was just an awesome experience I grew up doing that and I grew up even though I grew up in New York City we had cousins who had a pack outfitting company, like a guides, hunting guides company out in Wyoming. 
And I would go to, to fly fishing in the Wind Rivers back in the early 80s when maybe 400 people went up there a year. And this is a region in Wyoming that's probably the size of, uh, you know, maybe Vermont. It's, it's enormous. And, and so it was a complete wilderness. And um, so I thought that I was, I was kind of, after that, I was, uh, after I got back from Scotland, I did a whole bunch of different things. I, uh, I did jewelry design. My cousin's husband was a jewelry designer. So I helped him. I worked in post-production. I had no idea what I wanted to do. So mm -hmm. I was just kind of trying it out. And I'd always been creative and had certain skills or, or talent towards that those sort of endeavors and at one point I went uh I went snowboarding and I found the experience of going up the 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 ski lift so uncomfortable with a snowboard I was thinking there's got to be a better way to, to do this no one's and so you know because you go on the, the the ski lift is made for skis facing forward but when you're in a snowboard and it's connected to your foot you're 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 kind of sitting there for 15 minutes pigeon foot like that and it's really uncomfortable so I called up a friend of mine who was an, uh, an aerospace engineer and he and I started designing an electromagnetic snowboard binding that would allow your foot to rotate when you were on the ski lift and then go back and at some point someone said to me why don't you go into industrial design and I was like great idea what is that and so <laughs> I, I walked over to, to Pratt Institute with my anthropology degree and I looked around and I was like, you know, seeing these, these drawings of, of concept cars on the wall and, you know, three-dimensional models of things. I was like, I could do this. And, and so I, uh, I, I put together a portfolio of some of my travel photographs and, and some of my artwork from the, from the two art classes I took at, at Kenyon College and, uh, and then I threw together some other pieces that I created and I went for an interview uh, and they let me in right after the interview. And then I thought, what's wrong with this place? <laughs> I was like, wait a second. And, you, you know, it was like that, that Groucho Marx idiom that any club that would have me as a member, I wouldn't want to be a member of. And so, but I, I ended up going to school uh, at Pratt and getting in uh, a a master's degree in industrial design and uh and you grew up with parents who were architects and also went to pratt right my right so so that was why they're like why don't you go check it out so I, they were living <laughs> in park slope and i walked over there and yeah and and so they went there in the 60s and my father's an architect my mother's an artist and uh they, they had great friends still from from pratt i was like wow what a what an amazing place all these people and they were like family to me i was like that's a place to meet amazing people and so I went to Pratt and then nine days after graduating, I had a job uh, in lined up for myself in Italy. And so I, I was gone before the graduation ceremony. My father had to go pick up, you know, my diploma and, and some awards and, and I was already in Italy and I land not speaking a word of Italian, not knowing a single person, not having a place to live. And having this like kind of internship, I thought I was going to be there for three months, and I ended up there for six years. And and the internship was to work at. It was to work at a uh, with Mario Bellini, who was kind of like one of the the seminal figures of uh, of you know the Italian design uh, uh, aristocracy. And so I, you know, I and I got to the office. And I, I come in the first day and, and I, you know, go to the main office and they're like, who are you? I was like, wait a second, what do you mean? And so they, oh, okay, it's okay. And then, and so I started working there and ultimately, um, you know, I just, one thing led to another and I, I stayed longer and longer and made friends and, and met a girl and this and that. And, you know, and, and I had this experience for six years in Italy and, and, and uh, before coming back and, 2006. That's so. amazing. I, I want to pause right there for a second. First of all, thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, pleasure. Um, I guess what I'm, what question comes to mind for me is like, what was your perspective going in 
to industrial design school and then coming out? Like, how did your perspective shift or even before you studied anthropology and after, like, what were some of those things that really changed your perspective while you were a student? Granted, I know you're still a student because we're all still learning mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. so, so really, it's like, what are some of those moments when you look back, you're like, wow, that really shifted. Like when I look back at my own life in architecture school, I remember, I mean, my perspective just continues to change all the time. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I was like, oh, it's going to be cool to have a building I designed and it would be my building. Uh -huh. <laughs> and now it's like, I'm like, how do you make art that nobody even knows you were a part of? And it's like transient and like, you know, making uh, flower garlands for the deities is like, it's almost like making sand art. It's like a similar concept, but it's like more about that process and really being immersed in that. And it's similar to what you were sharing with the Kurt Vonnegut quote the other day. Like mm -hmm. I read the letter actually that it came from and how he was telling students like just create and actually create, write something so good and then throw it away um, and don't let anybody read it, but just do it for the sake of doing it and like really immersing yourself in the process. So that was just something, I know that was a lot, but that was like, and, and it wasn't even like, I could go on. There's so many things. Go on, <laughs> go on. But another, I had a it's on a roll. it was Paul Young and he was like, design is a service. And that really blew my mind because I was like, oh, okay. Everything I thought about design just like, just went out the window because it's actually about the service of design. It's like how you serve people. Um, granted there's also art making, which is like a creative, like, I don't want to care what other people need. I just want to do this out of curiosity. So I feel like there's this balancing of like curiosity and I just want to see what happens and then like serve what's the need. Like mm. that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think that, I think that curiosity is is at the core of of an interesting life and an interest and interesting people and uh you know that it, without curiosity i mean i don't i just i don't know how people make decisions and you know what drives them and i you know i i can't say that i've ever had tremendous clarity for myself as to where I want to arrive, you, you know, that I, th there's some people, I think maybe you can divide the world in many ways, but in one way, you can divide into two kinds of people. You can divide into people who who just know that they're just passionate about one thing and they just go for it. And and they they usually achieve success, uh, in, you know, in a, in, a, in a conventional sense of what they are are seeking. And they, and those are the ones that, that within the, the, social structure you do very very well typically and then there are the rest of us who have no fuck, fuck idea <laughs> <laughs> can i say fucking on camera it's like you can say no? it. fucking. <laughs> okay sorry <laughs> no idea uh um you know like where exactly they want to go and there it's just the experience of the the journey that is is guiding them and that they're they need m multiple things uh you know multiple experiences and that input to feel fulfilled and stimulated and, and things like that and that's that's been my experience and that's my my life's journey and and if you are open to that i think that you can have a very interesting life and unexpected life and and experiences that other people don't have and and that's what led me to you, you know have the all these kind of random and wild adventures in in my life and meet the most interesting people all over the world and learn through those experiences and and i think there is no better teacher than than experience and and so that's been kind of my approach and and even at my my tender young age, I am still 
proceeding that way. And, and, and it's frustrating. It's not always, it's, it's not always easy because I think particularly as you get older and you have responsibilities that you didn't have as a younger person, you have, you feel certain constraints to, to the choices that you can make, but it's, it's almost a, it's, it's almost a, an illusion because it's all, it's kind of like a fractal where, where, even when when certain doors are closed, you get into something, there's still so many possibilities within it. And I found that the only thing that you really shouldn't do, and this gets back to curiosity, if you want to, to have an interesting life and experiences and move forward, is that you can't stay in the same place. And, and you, you know, you can't just work it out in your head and just and make all those decisions in your mind and then go do it you you have to continue to move and mm -hmm. and try things and explore and and so forth so that's for, for better or worse at least that's that's been my approach that's so beautiful um as you were sharing i was and you mentioned the diversity of experiences i remember as a kid okay i have a confession as a kid i was like one day I want to be in a world where there's like all these different people from different backgrounds and scientists, artists, engineers, and like we're and all. And then you came to my event. <laughs> That's right. I did you lose it? <laughs> Actually, I was like, because that's another thing. I was like, I want to be like where the movers and the shakers of the times are. But I really felt like, okay, I went to one of your events. I went to a few at different points in time. Mm -hmm. And Martin Chalfi was speaking and I didn't know who he was, but he was, you know, featured on science and yeah. nature, right. And all these like very prestigious science. Nobel, people. Nobel laureate, right. Nobel yep. laureate. Yes. Um, and I was like talking to one of my friends who's a stem cell scientist and she's like, babe, nature is like the vogue of science. And she's from England. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, Babe, Martin, Chalfy, I wish. <laughs> I, I like that. That's a great quote. You should send that into them. That that could be their tagline. The Vogue, the Vogue of, science. of Science. Right, right. <laughs> oh my God, that's hilarious. <laughs> so I really that that's a memory that I've really kept. Like it's something that. <clears throat> Yeah, I continue to think about, and now with everything, like even with AI and design, I actually want to ask you, what do you think about some of the changes that are happening today and all this introduction of AI in the world? Wow. How it's affecting design. Yeah, I, I, um, well, I, I think that that I'm like everybody else. I am I am uh, well, I think there's some people who are I, I'm I'm like everybody else who's who's paying attention to it. And and I mean then then and then there are people who are really paying attention, really experts in it. I'm I'm not an expert in AI and and I, I don't consider myself an expert in anything really. And and what I in whatever I practice, whether I'm actually doing design work or strategy work or you know build, building business models the thing that i think is my personal strength is understanding people and the things that drive them and and what how they you know perceive value and what their needs are and so forth and i i like am user centered design yeah i mean it's right in 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 broad strokes it's human centered design and it it's, you know, there's there's human centered design and there's design thinking, and those are those are really, I think, methodologies, um, and they're they're very good methodologies. Uh, and and I I also think of design. I've been I've been playing with this idea. I think we we talked a little bit about it, about about the importance of uh, philosophy and design and and ethics and design and thinking about it from a from from those standpoints without. Uh, yes <laughs> without so much about this lately like the ethics of ai and like this has been a really big topic in my mind for several weeks like it's been consistent sorry please continue no 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 that's great that's great and and but in 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 my thinking it's it's even further detached from 
the applications of of the technology. It, yeah. It's like it, it is important. It's very very important in the applications of technology. But I think even as we step back, it's like why why are we doing anything that we're doing? And and in many instances, in as, as it seems to be part of our human condition that drives us, it's the answer is because we can, and that's not really a good answer. That doesn't lead us to, to anywhere that we want to go. And as someone who who admitted that I don't have clarity for myself, you know that it's like that on a macro level. But I'm not going to play with you know with with bombs if I don't know how to how to defuse them or how to use them. So and this is this is the most powerful potential bomb that I think humanity has ever created. Um, I I'm teaching a, a class at uh, at NYU. Mm-hmm. that is uh kind of it's it's spon- it's NSF sponsored and it's around kind of innovation and, and commercialization and um I asked my students what they thought of AI mm-hmm. and now presumably these are these are very smart young people who who came into the school and I believe that they are and and I've really enjoyed them and I have a lot of respect for them. And I asked this question, and one girl who who I you know I, I have to admit I think is one of the the brightest in the class, and and she she was kind of like sitting back in her chair, and she's like, "Well, you know, whatever. We'll just let AI make all the decisions for us, and and da 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 da. And it's like you know we use it, and and it'll be. And another and another student was saying how like it's going to be, uh, you know, it's going to be like." it's going to make using the internet so much in the web so much easier. And, and it's just like, clearly they had no conception of what this was from a technical standpoint, from a social standpoint, from a, a ethical, philosophical, any stand, they had not given it any thought. These are, these are the future engineers of the world. These are the people who are supposedly going to be able to, they're, they're not electrical engineers or, or, you know, they're, they're, different kinds of engineers. But I mean, my God, you're going to be participating in the creation of, of it, it's going to be pervasive. It's already pervasive. We're already using it in ways they had no idea. And and uh, I mean, I, you know, we, I changed the, the whole subject of the class to talk about that with them. And so for two hours, we talked about it and I had them write down 10 minutes. I said, write down your best case scenario for AI and your worst case scenario. And their their field of vision and imagination was like this. They just could not conceive. Yeah, I like, right? The setup was like, there was like, it is like they had they had no, I mean, it was, it was as I described, you know, it's going to help us with uh, this. Like one. optimism, you mean like excessive optimism? No, it wasn't excessive optimism. It was, it was, it was a lack of vision. It was a lack of imagination. It was a lack of critical thinking at all. It was and 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 worse, it was a lack of curiosity. And and so you, you know, I I talked to them about that. And as we started this this discussion, I think that curiosity is, you know, that's why you're here. That's why you know they should be here. They should be curious and they should be they should be here to learn and think about things that they hadn't thought about. And, and that should be driving them. And, and you talked about Martin Chalfi, uh, who, who's at Columbia, and the head of the bio department is Stuart Firestein. And, and in his talk at, at Lucid NYC, he, he, uh, he wrote a book called Ignorance. And, and it was the, the premise of the book was about how it's what we don't know that drives science and curiosity not what we do know and and so you know these these students are learning the you know how to use the tools but they're not learning and they haven't learned up until that point why they haven't thought about why for what any- the limitations of the tools are or how those tools were designed or what the why should they be what what wh- you know why should they be making the things that they're that they're making and what the implications are and why you know with all the skills and knowledge that they're acquiring what they could do with that and and you know what their greater purpose is uh 
and and look to, to be fair they're they're you know in their early 20s and and you know who's who's wise in their early 20s i certainly wasn't and i not that i'm wise now but it, it's you know and it was around that age that i i really did discover curiosity and 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 become curious so i'm i'm hoping that that at least in in the class i'm taking i'm mm-hmm. i'm i'm planting a seed that they can take forward and and maybe you know keep that in mind and utilize as they go forward because they're the ones who are one they're the ones who are going to be creating it and two they're the ones that are going to be most impacted by that and and they're going to be shaping the world that my daughters are going to be living in and and, and you know i want i want those people to be as wise as they could possibly be and and i'm i'm not particularly optimistic even with all the wisdom that we we might muster, but looking back at our history of how we make decisions as a collective humanity, that we we make wise decisions. And I gave them my best and worst case scenario for AI. And I'm not, we don't, that's a whole other, we and need then, a whole other then, hour was for that. that. The big, was that the big aha moment? Like, was there, like, did the perspective, the conversation change? Well, I think, I think that they, um, yeah, I kind of, I saw their eyes open wide and, and I think maybe one or two pooped their pants or something, but you know, it was, it was, uh, I mean, the, the reality is, and I, and I gave them a, a, a case study of, um, I'm not sure which AI model it was, but they gave it the task of performing a task that, and, and they gave it parameters and tools and they didn't tell it how to how to do it. And this is what AI and machine learning is able to do. It, it tries, it, it's like a, a mechanized version of, of design thinking where it's iterative, you know, it's, it's th- does this work? Does that work? Does that work? You know, in, in whichever path it shows to be effective, at least in one step. It as goes in back. what the human accepts as like something. Yeah, it, well, but in this case, it's like, okay, you know, that got me the result that I want. And, and so now that's a successful path. And now we can go a little further. So it it was, it it was, it had to get a task done and it was challenged. Um, and it, the task required that it, it go online and do something, but it mm-hmm. runs into CAPTCHA. And CAPTCHA mm-hmm. is, is that, that image that pops up to make sure that you're, you're not a robot. Are you human? Right. And they're like, you know, pick out all the stoplights in the, in these, in, in this grid of nine or 12 images and AI still can't do that thing, thankfully. <laughs> and so, so what did it do? It, it went online itself. It was not programmed to do this. It found fiber. It, which is a kind of like you hire a uh, you you hire a person to do a task. It's kind of like task rabbit. And <clears throat> it took five dollars. It put five dollars out there and and said, uh, I need someone to to do this captcha for me. And so someone comes online and says, Oh, that you know, I'm, I'll I'll do it. But you know, why don't why do you need me to do it? Are you are you uh, are you a human or are you a, a robot? And and they had programmed it so that they could see the the logic processing of it. And the processing said, if I tell this person that I am AI, that I'm a robot, he will not do it for me. So it came up with a story that I'm actually blind. And, And so I can't solve this. I'm doing this thing and I need someone with sight to do it for me. And the person said, okay, and did it for them. And and it completed it, and then it went on and completed the task. So it lied to to someone and fooled them and created a completely original story uh, to do that. So now you're thinking, oh my God, the future of of you know what what is that on steroids in the future when it starts doing that all the time? Now think about that person who did it. That person still doesn't know that they were fooled into believing that. So so now, instead of thinking about that future, think about all of us right now, because that could be happening and is happening, and we don't know it. That's the future of AI. And so, so we are all experiencing, a, I think, a, a period of, of tremendous transition and upheaval due to technology, geopolitics, all, all these things. And this 
I mean, in, in the science fiction, plausible science fiction realm, it could be already being driven by artificial intelligence. What is? You mean all of all of the chaos that we're experiencing, what we're you, you I know. have wondered about this too. I, I mean, honestly, we're already putting so many things on, like, even just like I worked at Bloomberg for a number of years, and it's like, how many people just set up automated this and like have it trigger that and let this happen? And then like all these systems that are just running automation, and then you're just like where's the head that's deciding like the the bigger picture that's not just motivated by money and if the machines are programmed to think about like financial money money income like just dollars and banks it's like okay what does that mean and honestly i i go to the matrix that's where i end up <laughs> like it, everything ends up at the matrix, matrix. Huh? everything ends up at the matrix it does Everything ends up in the matrix. It is it is actually the most brilliant, you know, science fiction concept or or you know, reality concept that I've ever that I've ever come across because it, it's true. It all comes back there. So the the uh, I think the critical juncture for AI and our our experience with AI is going to come. What right now everything we're doing is human directed, and AI does it. I think there are two critical junctures in AI. One is when AI starts being self-directed. When we are no longer telling it what to do, we set it off. And once that happens, we cannot put the genie back in the bottle. Whatever's going to happen then is, is we've, we've set the course and it's done. And, um, and, and I'll give you, I'll give you another example. I, uh, I think it was Google. Uh, they were doing an experiment with two AIs and, and they, they allowed them to communicate and the AIs were started to communicate with each other in a language that the programmers couldn't understand. And it was, you, you know, they were sending more and more information back and forth between them and they had to shut it down because they didn't know what it was saying, what it would do. And, and that was, so you know, imagine when AI becomes self-directed and, and we have programmed to, to the best of our abilities, because what we're going to do is we're going to set it up to, to benefit us. And we are going to say, you know, help us solve our problems, make our world a better place and, and don't harm humans. Right. And, and, but the, the inherent cognitive dissonance of those things make you know save the world and make it you know make it sustainable if we are the reason that that can't happen you have two conflicting directives if human if if human activity is is destroying the climate and we we say save the climate and and help people what it, 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 what if what if the conclusion it reaches on its own is well we have to get rid of people or we have to get rid of more people some of the people I, I don't know who knows what it comes up with but the point is if if when it's directing itself the whole point of machine learning and artificial intelligence is that it will be a its own intelligence it will be conscious it will make decisions on its own you know, we understand that we create the algorithms, but what it does with the algorithms, we don't understand. Yeah. I mean, so here's an interesting thing. And thank you so much for what you shared there. I think that was a really insightful um, example, right? Of just like, well, what if it decides on its own? Well, then get rid of humans because we're trying to save the planet. Like these humans are really messing up the planet and it looks like just get rid of them. And yeah. And it's also like, I, you brought this up earlier about what is the philosophy that's driving you. And this is actually, I was listening to this today as well. I was listening to this talk on nonviolent communication um, with some of my teachers and they were talking about like, I don't know if you've studied it at all. It's like a, a whole but study. Does it seem like I have? <laughs> It studies, it studies, like, yeah, you, you seem pretty self-aware, but it's really like everything is like in the heart and core of it. We have needs as human beings mm -hmm. 
And whether or not we recognize it or not, we're often saying like, I need you to do this. I need this to happen. But those are strategies. The need is like connection. The need is like acceptance. The need is like something right. much deeper than like all these strategies of like, mm -hmm. I'm going to, you know, we're going to go out to dinner. This is going to happen. Like these are like strategies. But the point of this was like, even that philosophy or this like framework for thinking is limited in that you get into this moral relativism. And at some point there has to be like a framework of ethics or what is absolutely true and what is like, and there has to be some alignment as souls and as humans where we can talk about like, what is like, what is good and what is bad, right? And there there is something to it. like. So in the nonviolent communication framework, it's like you want to have giraffe ears and not um, like you want to be really listening and really attentive to what the other person's um, feeling and what they need and what's underneath, like what's the, the unmet need underneath their dissatisfaction, for example, mm -hmm. um, or what is the, the met need under their joy. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the flip side, like you don't want to be like, I don't know, was it the hyena or some other animal that doesn't really like listen as much? So it's like, there is a sense of like, there is good and bad. Like, oh, we do not want this to happen to us as a species. Like we do want, like, this is bad, a bad way of behaving. And then, you know, what's interesting is like, even with factory farming or whatever it is in the world today that we, you know, just deem as okay. It's like a lot of legal language is like, what is the most, what a reasonable person would do, mm -hmm. you know, like, or under reasonable practices. So it's like, if it's reasonable that there's like thousands of chickens and like a little coop and it's just become the standard, then now it's like, just become the accepted standard, but no, it's, no. go ahead. No, no, sorry. Continue, please. No, that's it. That was really, please. But, but you know, it's like that there, there is no, it's, it's all, first, first of all, the, that kind of thinking is, is exactly what what drives design and uh you know like you have to understand what the underlying motivation is you, you know it, it's experience and it's what it, you know like there is there is no when i when i give my classes or if i do a keynote there's there's always one slide that i bring in which is or an example is that there's no intrinsic value in technology there's, it's not intrinsic and and I've I've talked to given this to to a room full of four hundred people. Raise your hand if you think there's intrinsic value in technology. Hands go up, or you know all of the hands. There is it's not intrinsic. It, it is all applied, and and so the things that we value, it's all it's all a human construct in our head, and and every individual makes a decision as to what they think is valuable to them. That's what the the exchange is, subconsciously is do i think that this object is is going to give me the experience that i value and am i willing to trade this abstracted you know concept of value money in exchange for for that experience and different people are going to say oh that's too expensive or that's not but what they're really judging is whether the experience is of value to them and and I wanted to go back to something that you said previously about AI and 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 philosophy. It, it really goes down even even in in the broadest sense towards the the meaning of life. And I you know it's it's you know it's kind of like when you reduce it all and and look at all the work that's been done. So why are we here? What is the purpose? What are we doing? AI doesn't have that. A I does not have that. And, and I don't know if it ever will. And if it does, what is that going to look like? So, so, you know, and if, if something doesn't have that, and maybe that, maybe some people will call that a soul, maybe that's the soul. What, what is driving its decision-making? What's driving its thinking at a, at a, you know, on a bigger level. I don't know. I mean, as long as it's running on batteries, then it's not a, a soul. That's, that's I, why I'm clear. For now. I'm going to say that if it's running on batteries, it's not a soul. Like, okay. I'm going to challenge you can that. unplug it or take the batteries out. 
then it does not have a soul. A bug has a soul. A butterfly has a soul. Um, every cow, dog, insect. I well, I, I agree with that. I agree with that. Uh, on you know, but like, humans do have a very special capacity where we can sit here and talk about like the ethics of AI, whereas like the cats can just kind of purr. Yeah, and that's that's that's. Listen, I always say that that dogs are the best humans. But I, but I'm going to challenge you on that, that, you know, AI wouldn't, doesn't have a soul because if it's on batteries, it doesn't have a soul. If you think what a battery is just, is just a, a energy source and supply, you're drinking that cup, which is giving you energy. That's your battery and your body is a big okay, so battery. This, okay. So you're calling this a battery. I get it. I am dependent on my environment as a, with, because I have a body, I, I'm dependent on feeding, breathing. I'm actually completely interdependent and dependent on my environment. It's the spark. It's the spark that, you know, that that you started with this with this uh discussion about. Well, the spark actually, I mean, according to the the Vedas, um, uh, the spark is actually like eternal. Yeah, like okay, so Veda really means truth. And the idea is like, so we're here in this world where um, our senses are limited and sure we have all these like microscopes and telescopes and all these ways to try to expand our senses mm -hmm. but still are like we we make mistakes we have a tendency to cheat we put our planet in the current situation that it's in right like we um have all kinds of faults as humans and contradictions so yeah, so it's not like we've got some perfect senses and ability right. to tune in. So the idea of um, authoritative knowledge is that like, oh, there's knowledge that's actually coming from a source who is like an embodiment of the teaching, which is not, which is actually like fully ethical, moral, like someone who's like living, like shining. Well, yeah, and... And, oh let's, and they're getting the teaching from like, it's kind of descending, like truth is descending, like water flows, like that is one way, but you can have your own realization of the truth, which would be your like flavor of the truth. Like you would digest the truth and what would come out would be unique to you. Um, and that is what like the life experience is. It's like, we have our own realizations, um, but I, I now value much more like what are the sacred texts of the world saying and what is the essence of the teachings of the different uh, religions and philosophies of the world and how can we really understand the ethics of what it means to be aligned with the path of the soul in these bodies and i think then the questions of like what what happens with ai and how do we navigate the ethics of ai all of this becomes more clear if we have a foundation that can empower us to have real meaningful conversations yeah you you uh, you gave me a, a new worst case scenario came to my mind it, it is like it, it's it, it, I mean first of all that's uh, you know and I, and I love your your perspective and and the, you know we had talked previously about spirituality and and I I you know I really appreciate your your approach to that and your feeling on that and but what you you brought to my mind was the I had never thought before of you know taking ai what if i know where you're going ai ai not. becomes the the, the, the police. deity no the new a deity the the new religion and people people believe in ai religiously because because the thing and and you know ai has read all of our texts that's all already our... the case i think some people are like well, that right well it's, it's... like and you've been talking about this a lot like for the sake it's like an end in itself versus like okay please continue this is so exciting and interesting. but if it uses yeah. but the thing is 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 because we don't know you know if we don't control the purpose of ai and and what it does and it decides you know it it 
it has a like currently what it does is it's programmed to achieve an end and it finds the best way to achieve that end and and so you know there have been numerous examples if you want to to create compliance the the most effective and and long lasting way to do that is through religion and and it has been done you know in in many different ways and i i just it just occurred to me that that ai could create a a re, its own religion and and the thing is because it has apps it will have absolute uh access to the sum of human knowledge mm -hmm. it, it it will be it will and we will have absolute dependence on it i don't know how we could discern reality from whatever it's providing i mean look look already how hard it is for us to discern the you know what we're what we're reading what we're hearing what we're seeing the 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 uncanny divide between is is when we are is is that point at which visually when computer uh silicon graphics an image is it's a deep fake so it's it's when when even subconsciously we're like that looks a little weird you know that we're not sure what's real versus what's not real but that is just that is just testing where our senses where the where the confines of our senses are so that it can get better at fooling us and now it could do it it can take 15 seconds of our voice and reproduce our voice it can I reproduce know, us in video crazy. in movement in, and it has access to everything that we do and see. And and it is, you, you know, I mean, it is, yes, it can be used for good. And I and I I think it will be used for good as well. But um, you know, I think that that if history has shown us anything, we it, it will not only be used in, in the best ways possible. Yeah, and, and it's not just other humans that might use it in a certain way, but that it this entity on its own or this like network of like those robots that were talking to each other at Google and they're like, what are no. they saying? Well, it's not OK. And then I the science fiction movies and like all of them really start to be. It's not science like fiction. I mean, like so many things. It's like th think about this thing. How how much time do you spend on your phone? A lot. Okay, a lot, right? We all spend a lot of time on our phone, way too much time, right? Yeah. And how much in front of your computer, right? So, so my point is, it, and you have all these apps that are, that are supposed to be serving you, and they are they are actually absorbing you into them to to give more time and attention to them. Now, the thing is, who is serving who? Are you, is it serving you, or are you serving? it at through or the companies through through which you know they are reaching you and now if rather than the companies it's ai behind it with with a different directive with its own directive that it is controlling at what point do we become so what if what if there's an emp there's no technology all of a sudden what happens societal collapse within three days that's what's projected Okay. Oh my God. Well, that's so, so what if we become dependent on it? And, and, and so it, yeah. we are it right now. It has no body. Yeah. AI has no body, but instead of, you know, we're thinking, oh, it's going to have a robot body, but what if we become the body? That's the singularity, right? And we think, oh, it's going to serve us and we're going to make us more of what we already are. But what if it uses us to make it us more right, that's the is. matrix i mean that it is, is. The matrix. It's, it's that the is the matrix it all so, comes back to the matrix so i mean it's interesting because um i think the thing here that we're getting to i first of all there's a theme one theme is around what is actually i feel like there's a question of yeah there's too many people that worship technology and mm -hmm. too many people that worship. I, I think I was once a technology worshiper, former technology worship right. recovering. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like let's, let's, let's like progress with technology for the sake of tech. It's interesting. Like, let's see what we can do. Bleeding right. edge. You know, like it's really because cool. we can. Yeah. Let's see what else is possible. Um, 
And now I feel I have a different perspective, Mm -hmm. right? It's like, well, wait, um, like the question you asked, why am I here? What is this world? I mean, it's already a matrix. We're already in this, the fact that like, we're in a body and like we have no conception of a previous body and like there's no memory of a previous body and we're just like in this body and then like you love someone and they're gone they left their body and you're like what happened to them and that in itself is like a type of illusion right um because according to all the sacred traditions of the world like there is a spirit that is like eternal And if you want to say what's real and what's fake, what makes something real is actually it being eternal. Like it's not something you can turn off or end or finish. Like if it has a beginning or an end, then it's not, um, well, it's, it's not, it's, it may be matter, but it's not spirit. Well, I think that that there are different names for it and you can you can you can frame it through spirituality and religion and things like that and but you know, or you can or you can look at it through science and and it, it ends up in the same place because other not, religion it, right well yes and no but but there's i i don't i wouldn't call it religion i would call it um i i think what you're referring to is is the 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 absolute belief in in it by by some people um but the the thing is is that it's like uh, I forgot where I was going. The um, sorry, I didn't mean to derail. No, 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 that's okay. Um, the thing about science is we were talking about what's eternal versus what is temporary. Oh, right. That that right. So so that that things never actually get destroyed. They just get transformed. You know, energy just transforms into another form, and that's. Right. You, you know, religion talks about that same concept in a different way. And science talks about it in this way. Mm-hmm. And, and, so, yeah. and it gets back to, to you know, when we when we, we met the other day about about process philosophy, where we are all in a constant state of becoming. Everything is in a state of becoming. Mm-hmm. And, and so it's, you know, we're transforming from one thing into another and becoming in another. And some of these things just are on a scale that is way beyond our ability to conceive mm. over a time frame that you know over, over a galactic time frame i mean we think about mountains being you know immutable but they are just in the process of they, yeah. they come up and they're in the process of eroding and you know you you look through those wood, time lapse. wood fire burn smoke it's oh, like right. trans- so that's one type of transformation but yep. then there's also human where it's like, okay, there's a mother and then there's a baby and then the baby grows up. And like, you're the same person you were when you were a baby and now you're an adult, but you're like a whole different looking person, but you're like still the same person, but you're a different person also. Like all of your cells have changed. Everything has changed. But then the idea, at least um, this idea of like, let's say reincarnation, the idea is that the soul is moving between different bodies like it's moving from which is different than a piece of wood that burns right but but the thing right exactly so so the you're talking about the the soul and science we'd be talking about it as energy and and so the thing is is you know yes we we grow we we we're born and we grow and we're you know we have we have our energy and it's it's contained in our form and then when we die it's it's turned into other forms and it might be, you know, in, in the religious construct in, in Eastern religion where there's reincarnation, that energy is is collected and put into another form. Well, right? not collected, but it's like uh, the yeah, spark. Yeah. The spark right. that's moving is actually moving between, like, is like, okay, I'm done with the cricket body. Now I'm ready for the snake body. And mm-hmm. then like do does the snake thing there's eight million four hundred thousand species until it's like i'm actually going to be a human i want to ask the questions why am i here what's my purpose i want to learn from a teacher i want to study with people who are really wise and i want to look at the character of somebody and really based on who inspires me make decisions that are able to really move me forward in a beautiful 
There you go. You you just brought it back full circle. That's awesome. You know, it's it's like how do we make it? That's that's what we're here for. That's you know what that's that comes back to curiosity. Like what make make our lives interesting and and you know curious and and seek that out. See seek, seek out those those answers for yourself, whatever that is to you. I think that's I think that's what we're here for. I think the other thing that came up in this is like character is not really how does how do we live with great character and how is that something that we teach a machine if we're hypocrites? You know, like we almost have to not be hypocrites to be able to teach um not being a hypocrite. Because it doesn't work. It's almost like, you know, the story of like Gandhi's telling, he wants to tell someone not to eat sugar. He's like, I can't tell him now, come back in three weeks. So they come back in three weeks. Like they had to go through this long trip and the mom's like, okay, tell him. And then Gandhi's like, okay, don't eat sugar. And the mom was like, why didn't you just tell him that three weeks ago? And he's like, because I had to overcome my own attachment to sugar. So it's like, it's it's not potent unless it's lived. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's that's a whole other thing. And I was I was just speaking to my wife about that about how frustrating it is. I have I have twin six year old daughters, and and how frustrated I am that I have so much that I want to impart to them, and that that but there's nothing I can say to teach them something that can only be learned experientially. And that's the, you know, that is the, the paradox of, of parenting is that, that, you know, you just have to, you just have to let them experience life for themselves and, and try and help them to, to, to give them the, the right experiences. And I, my, my perspective on parenting changed once I had kids where I think that a lot of, a lot of people have this idea that they are, um, that they're going to, you know, teach their kids in a way so from their own mistakes and and they're gonna you know they're gonna make a, a better version of themselves and I I realized very quickly it's like this this thing is has come pre-programmed with its own directive I have very little influence what my role is is to be the guardrails on the road of life and just keep them and give them as wide a road as possible to to careen back and forth and just keep them from falling off the damn road and and that's that's it and 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 to the degree that i can you know point them at, you know steer that road in the in the right direction but ultimately it's their choice and it's their experiences and that's what makes them them and and all of us individuals yeah i think so too that's so beautiful thank you for sharing that um wow okay Hold on a second. I'm holding. Okay, so here's the question, the realization, the moment of truth. This is something we should talk about. We want to talk about. I want to talk about. I hope you do too. Um, okay, so let's say our ethicists and our AI ethicists who are working at Google and getting paid a lot of money to make decisions about the future of AI. Let's say they say, like you said earlier, Julian, you said, well, we they have to learn, like, okay, not to kill humans off. The AI needs to understand that, like, this is a priority. Like, well, it's don't program, right? It's part huh? of the it's part of the program. It's part of it's programmed into the algorithm. Yeah. Right. So what if um what you're saying that is what's programmed into the algorithm? Well, the algorithm has like they have to they're they're trying to program it to do, you know, to, to have certain parameters and, and towards a certain outcome like these are. Yes. But, but anyway, carry on. Like, Go on. Well, OK, so you are. But you're saying this, that they are doing this today, like already that those are some of the inherent. Algorithms they're, like that are being put into place. Well, they cr- <laughs> the rules that they're putting into place, like. Don't harm humans. Yes, I mean in, in broad terms, yes. And and you know, I I am not a a programmer of algorithms and, and AI, but but in broad terms, and you you should ask someone like that. But they are given, you know, the 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 algorithms are are given parameters to to achieve certain outcomes. 
or they're given they're they're given like instructions yeah like like end goals and and here are the parameters of the constraints for for you to to achieve that end goal and then it goes and it learns how to how to achieve it if you've ever worked in a company where you saw how even engineers and product managers like failed to communicate properly like just yeah. that problem of like and then like what the user sees what the engineer thought what the product manager thought like what marketing said just like such a vast difference sometimes when i think about these things i'm like who knows what's happening under the hood yeah well i mean the and and the the irony is that that they don't the people who are that like that that story that i told you before is like they the the people who who create that who write the algorithms and create the algorithms they create the algorithms but then once the algorithms are unleashed they don't know how they, they don't really know how it comes to to those conclusions and and how it it arrives there that's why artificial intelligence is there because it can do things you know, at a scale that the human mind can't. That's why it's so good at at doing like these, you know, crunching mass amounts of information and and, and synthesizing it into something that that we can, you know, comprehend or utilize. That's what it's for. Take all the sum total of of global knowledge that's on the internet and find me, you, you know the answer to this question he, and, and they can say okay this and, and they can say this percentage that percentage this does that or i mean that's a very straightforward answer um or, or question and, and result but th there's another thing that that always comes to mind for me with with this kind of thinking on artificial intelligence and it i have you ever seen uh 2001 Space Odyssey, the, the the Stanley Kubrick film, right? It's it's an amazing film. Have you ever read the book? It's okay. I highly recommend reading the book because it makes sense of a lot of things that that are hard to to understand in the movie. And I read it with there's one with the prologue by Arthur C. Clarke, which is which is awesome. But in 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 the movie, if you recall. They're they're on the moon. They discover a monolith on the moon. For, you know, in the first scenes, they have there's a monolith, in, and you have these kind of like humanoid, you know, monkey creatures that you know that that and and they touch the the monolith, and then you know one of them get takes up a a, a bone and and you know starts beating the other ones, and it, it's it, what was happening is that the monolith was imparting knowledge to them and and to to evolve them more quickly and and uh cut to you're then on the moon and you know humans are on the moon and there's this big crater and they have a the similar monolith in 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 the crater on the moon and they touch it and it it goes it sends out this this signal it, like this noise comes out and they're all going like that and and then it cuts into like something where it's completely you're like what did that have to do with the next scene you have no idea then you cut to towards the end of the movie where where after all of the the kind of chaos between between the astronauts and hal the computer who which actually is is has two competing directives that it can it can't reconcile this is this is very much the heart of the challenge of ai but but after you, you know when at, at the point where the astronaut goes in to you know he goes through the, the this kind of light tunnel and he comes out in this room and there's a bed in the room and there's a tv in the room and there's there's like the sculpture and it all looks like the 1960s but this is now 2001 you, you don't know why this room is is it's not clear from the movie why the room is is decorated like that but it's because the the monoliths were actually recorders and they were recording all the tv stations are recording the the radio waves they're recording everything they could of human evolution and activity on earth and and when the humans found it on the moon it, it then transmitted all that information into space and and so when they finally got to uh the moon of jupiter which is where they thought there might be life 
they and he goes in and and he ends up in this room that that the that intelligence that created it was all based on information that had been sent out 40 to 50 years earlier because in in the 1960s versus or or in the in the late 60s when when yeah. humans went to the moon and then in 2001 they arrived but that was information was dated yeah so that's I, you know like anyway I, I that was a tangent you can you can edit that out of this so, that's, so <laughs> why so what made you share that um I think because it, it it's it has to do with the the idea of artificial intelligence or or artificial intelligence collecting information on us to to uh you know through our own we we are we are the miners for information for artificial intelligence we're feeding it into this repository mm -hmm. that it is then using to to do whatever it, which to, may not be relevant in 50 years well yeah that's kind of that was kind of like the science fiction aside but it, but it, it it's relevant in the sense that it's um whether it's relevant in 50 years or or now uh just the fact that it's collecting that information and and trying to synthesize it in a way and 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 use it in a way that that makes sense to us mm -hmm. and to repurpose it and repackage it in a way that that makes sense to us that was you, you know that's that i mean it's one it's one potential eventuality that you know maybe this we arrive at that point it goes so far beyond us i don't know i think what really came to me um was just this question of how does AI determine if it gets to make decisions about like, I'm going to protect this or let's destroy that, or this should go away. Um, there's something, there's something there. And I feel like we have to have a whole other conversation about this to get into what is intelligence? What is the mind doing? Right. Mind is different than, let's say, intelligence is like a higher faculty than the mind. The mind is like, OK, I'm seeing things. I'm like understanding the world. The senses are like feeling and touching and seeing. But the mind is like interpreting. But the intelligence is like even higher order. It's like a decision maker that's like what like it's got the morality. It's got the ethics. It's got a sense of like purpose and understanding something higher. So it's interesting how when we get into this question of AI, um, we get into this question of actually there's an in intelligence and then it kind of brings this question of what is intelligent design? And what do you think? What is intelligent design? I I, I mean, like, yeah, I, are, are you talking about in, in terms of, of religious uh definition of intelligence well, what is the definition of religious uh well i i don't know i mean the thing is is all of these things you you just gave a definition of intelligence versus mind versus other things that that you know i we could have the discussion on that and and say okay this is the way we're using it now mm -hmm. i wouldn't have i wouldn't have thought of it exactly that way but you know that's yeah. that's like how, how would you define intelligence Oh, I don't know. I don't know. But 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 the I think that that all these conversations and I think that language, every everything we're experiencing, but the the the, the use of language is an approximation to to convey our our individual experiences that we're all having through our senses. Mm -hmm. That we're making sense of it and and then we use language and ultimately we're all having an a absolutely unique experience, even if we're having it together even if we're we're at the same concert we're having you and i are sitting here but you are having the experience of talking to me and i'm sorry for that but i'm having a wonderful experience of talking to you and and and, and so you, you know if, if if i were to say to you close your eyes and think of the color red and i'm thinking of a color red and now you open your eyes and I say okay you know what 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 color were you thinking of? And, and you were to have, if I was to have all the swatches out there, you'd point to one of those swatches and I'd point to another. You know, even if I was to describe it to you, you, you know, it's an approximation 
of, of the experience we're having. And that's what language and communication is about. So yeah, well, I don't think there's an absolute. I'm the third with the etymological dictionary, but yeah. And, and, you know, there are, but there are ways also to, but I think this is an, we can agree to it, but, but, but agreeing to, to, to a term is, is like, we can agree to the term of intel. I can agree to your definition of intelligence as you just stated it for the sake of this conversation so that we can, we can advance that conversation. Yeah. You know, I like that. I like that. Um, yeah. So then I guess, I, I mean, really it's, so when the word religion, I think because it's got many meanings and even if you get into the etymology of the word, um, I think there's this element of like even Dharma, like following your Dharma. It's, it's kind of knowing what path. So there's philosophy and there's practice. So you could say religion is just another word for the practice and the application. And then philosophy is more like the core, like foundational worldview mindset like how is everything related can we agree on something foundational versus like a pl application of those teachings mm -hmm. so then in that sense i feel like that definition because i feel like religion's kind of like got this weird connotation sometimes where it's misunderstood um and oh, I so when we talk about intelligent design yeah, it's like, okay, basically, it's like, is everything random? Or was everything kind of designed? Just like we're designing these computer systems. Like, who designed this world? Yeah, I mean, I it, it is, well, I think that the, you know, then, then we could go back to to the science, uh, you know, uh, versus versus religious perspective on, on reincarnation, you know, that, that, thinking of it as energy versus thinking of it as, as spirit. And it's, it's, so when, if you do the same thing with intelligence is what is intelligence, how, how are you defining that? If it's, if it's that there, there's a certain order to things, then yeah, there's, it, it adheres to, to, I think that the universe adheres to a certain order. I think that that's been, been proven through science. Um, but whether or not that's intelligence in the common sense of the term, uh, I, I don't think it applies. I think that, you, you know, but I think that that from a religious perspective of, of most of the, you, you know, Western or, or Judeo-Christian perspective of, of it is that, that, you know, it, it, it I mean, the, the, there, there's a, there's a, paradox there that that god is all powerful but then but then god is personified in in these traditions mm -hmm. with the some of the limitations of human frailty mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. but then it's all but also omnipotent and mm -hmm. all knowing and mm -hmm. so i you know it, there's i don't really you know i i think that that it depends on how you look at it when you ask the question of intelligent design you know how you're you could choose any different way to to define that intelligence that's amazing that's actually really brilliant um there's yeah like that whole aspect of um even personhood and limitation of a person it's like we think about people as like frail and have problems and like so any person so then if you want to give a personality to a divine being um like in islam it's interesting they're like they talk about the all pervasive white light energy that is everywhere allah um in like the vedic paradigm it's like well there's a supreme personality of godhead from which the light emanates and then also within each being there's like the eternal spark which is also individual and unique like your spark is unique you don't just like drop it somewhere it's like a unique and eternal spark, um, which is connected to this divine fire, you can say. So then it's like, um, but then this idea of person, like having a personality, like, you know, and even in the Bible, it's like man was made in the image of God, right? So it's like, but what does that mean? Like I have likes and dislikes. Well, then God also has preferences, right? right? Like God is not just like, 
you know, and we're not automatons that are like, that don't have a free will, like we have a free will, but there's also this sense of like, there is a higher order. Like there's something really magical in like the DNA and like all of this. And, you know, some people like to say, well, it was just random, but it's like, do you know where we're going? Do you know where we were before death? Like before birth, after death, like, do you know? And so that's where we get into this question of like, I mean, God is actually speaking to us in multiple religions in the world. And like, we don't even listen because we're like, whatever, dude, <laughs> there's no, like, that's probably all BS. Look at all the wars that have been started in the name of religion, like throw it all away. So we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. And instead of like preserving what is essential, we've kind of lost connection with what is most essential. And if you teach an AI, that look, it's all matter and spirit is all just transformation of energy. It's not going to be able to say this is human and this is like a building because it's going to be like, it's all energy. Well, right. right and that's but, where I was trying to go. I finally was well, I think that's, no, no, no. I think that's a really, really interesting point. And I think it's a really good point because if we are, are if we want to utilize AI for our benefit, then, then I think that you have to consider that. But, but putting AI aside for a second, conceptually, all these religions are are always talk about the the relationship between the special relationship between God and us and humans, and mm -hmm. and it, and I think it it's attached to a purpose. It's a seeking of a purpose for us, you know, why we're here, that there's got to be a reason that we're here. And, and God is part of that. You know, we are part of that through God or God, vice versa. But what if yeah. that in intelligent design, not intelligent as we are, but just the order of things. And what if it is all energy and in order and there's no good and bad? It's only... In, in you know a, a construct you know that that is is the limitation of our own very very limited brains if we disappeared in a moment the the earth just popped out of existence okay wouldn't that order still exist it's 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 a little bit it, it's a it's a little bit of a nihilistic or maybe a lot of a nihilistic view but I think you can still look at God and intelligent design and all of that, just observing the magnificence of the order of things. And, and whether it's it's there to serve us or we're there to serve it or not, and you take us out of it, it's it, I mean, and, and that's what I think where I think that, that humans have become really disconnected with nature. And and so I think we see ourselves as a part, as a part of it, not not a part of it, not apart from nature, mm -hmm. and and but I think that that so we don't appreciate the order just for its own sake, and I think that 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 is more divine than than the um, than the kind of human centric uh, religious constructs that we've created personally that's the way i view it right like how about we just appreciate the isness of everything and like yes. how integrated we are with nature and what's the need of even getting into the what's good and what's bad not even how integrated how it all started and what happened before yeah. the big bang and all of that like let's not even well you could no you can look at ourselves. that you can you can absolutely and should absolutely look at it but, but if we're not discriminating that how are we going to teach the robots to discriminate between us and the i don't know dumpster well, but like that's your the, but that's the why the energy of like this mass of plastic in the ocean that needs to be converted to something else. But like, don't touch these energy masses here because they breathe. But that's but that's why your your previous point was so was so brilliant. I think because but what but the difference is that you're you're talking very much about the, the application, and it, and I think you need what you described 
for the application of artificial intelligence. But it doesn't, it's like the difference between pure mathematics and applied mathematics. Pure mathematics is just, is just, and my, my cousin is a, a pure mathematician. I mean, like look, genius, you know, and, and, you know, went to Princeton, was hired at Princeton when he was 23, you know, just one of those people. And, and I, I say, what do you do? He's like, I can't, I don't know. I can't describe it, but it's, it's really like, you know, he, he uses math to, to create these patterns, I think. And, and it just, and, and just the way that you can do all these things, but there's no application of it. That's a whole other thing. So I think you, what you identified is the need for that construct in order to have the application of AI be not only useful and beneficial, but not kill us. Yeah. And I think that's very, very, that, that's a really, really profound insight. And I think it's very, I hope that that some someone who, who can actually affect AI hears that, you know, well, in, in its development. Maybe that's, maybe that's, I'm sure it's a lot of people, but um, yeah, I mean, it's- What, what do you mean that, that your, your listeners- we're also we're also we're also here to to do where we are having an effect we are doing something so i hope that we can also and everyone who is listening um feels empowered to do something about it because we are really paving a way and i think i really hadn't thought too much about this um but i was like what's the philosophy of these ai ethicists and are they just relativists who don't believe in like, because really like, how can you train a robot to decipher between like anything if there's everything's relative? Because then you're just programming relativism. But into everything is relative. Everything is relative. That that was, you know, that was, was established by by Einstein, right? The 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 general theory of relativity and and it, you know well he also relative. said i want to know god's thoughts the rest are details like he wanted to know god's thoughts mm -hmm. so there are actually many layers of insight and it's not like we're, we're talking about the theory of relativity versus moral relativity and you said in the beginning of the call we don't want the robots to kill us so mm -hmm. it's like again, we're kind of caught in this little loop where it's like, are we saying everything's relative? Because it's not, we don't want to get killed by the robots. So we have to take some kind of like, where do we stand on this? But wherever we stand, it's going to be relative to something. But you're, we do. It's that I don't think they're mutually, I don't, I, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think those are mutually exclusive. I think it could be relative and we have to take a stand, but but it's it's Things stand relative to something, and where you know we're going to say, oh, okay, right about here feels right, and that's you know how we're going to how we're going to set it. This is okay. Before we go, I just want to share one little story, and I have so many other questions that I wrote down for you because I was just like, there's so much, but <laughs> um, really, I really got a few things that I so appreciate you so much. Just I see your humility and how much that inspires your creativity. It's very natural. So it's very sweet and endearing. And I really appreciate that about you um, and the way that you share, uh, sharing about your students in the classroom and like taking us there was really powerful for me to get to go there with you and to like be in that classroom and like really wanting to hear more. Well, let's hope they feel the same way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think this is definitely something that's been on my mind for a while and my heart. So I am super grateful that we got to talk about this, Julian. Thank you so much for all of your time today and for just being um, a wonderful person who's bringing curiosity and this sense of like critical thinking and looking at the world through this lens of like, how can we really understand what's going on and also shape things for the better? Well, thank you for for inviting me and and you know having the conversation and and giving me a, a chance to to think about it and share it with someone who's as thoughtful as you are. So I, I really do appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you so much, Julian. All right, I'm going to just stop the recording here. Sure. Um,